So what I'm going to discuss, hopefully, for the next 45 minutes or so is, uh, like Marianne said, a glimpse of uh, Milwaukee through its advertising covers. Now, uh, Eric, there we go. There's a delay in the Uh, in the progression. So I got started back in the mid 1970s when I moved to Milwaukee. And uh, at the time I had collected plate blocks, a childhood collection and went to a stamp show and was talking to someone about covers and they showed me advertising covers. And, and this happened to be one of them. I got a group of three uh, advertising covers from Johnson Electric Service Company, which is now Johnson Controls. And when I was looking at the cover uh, later on, I realized that this cover had been sent by Paul Johnson, the son of Warren Johnson, who founded the company. And in it was a letter that indicated that uh, he didn't like shoveling and he was from uh, Philadelphia and he didn't like shoveling. The winters were too harsh. Uh, and uh, it was a nice personal letter. And that sort of got me interested, not only in the advertising part, but then uh, the fact that there was a personal connection with the founder of the company. Uh, about five years later, I went on to work for Johnson Controls and got rid of that, uh, got rid of that cover with the enclosure, but kept a couple of the others that you'll see. So an introduction to Milwaukee, for those of you that aren't in Milwaukee, and uh, these both covers both date to 1893, and, and you can see it's an overall cover with the map of the harbor. And in the lower left, you can't read it, but but there's a discussion of the city uh, population at 260,000, the lowest death rate, how they measured that, I have no idea. Most homeowners per capita, 3,560 uh, factories and the largest machine works, breweries and tanneries. And this was a transitional time for Milwaukee because they were progressing or, or evolving from the natural resource-based economy, the tanneries, the grain elevators, and going into the uh, industrial sector and more of the manufacturing and of course brewing which we'll talk about but um, about this time Chicago was was becoming the big wheel in the in the grains and in the railroad uh, th at this time Milwaukee's population was 260,000 Chicago's was was over a million at this time and that uh, discrepancy kept growing over time uh, I have this map of for anybody that knows Milwaukee uh, this uh, uh, sorry, this map shows the downtown area of Milwaukee, the third ward as it's called. This is Wisconsin Avenue, also known as Grand Avenue back then. And I, I bring this up because you'll see East Water Street and West Water Street. Solomon Juno, one of the founders of Milwaukee, uh, sort of was in charge of the area east of the river. And Byron Kilborn was in a sense in charge of the area west of the river. Uh, they had feuds periodically. Uh, some of those feuds uh, we'll talk about, but at this time, the downtown Milwaukee was really the industrial center. Uh, if, if you go down here, you've got all of the grain elevators along the river, you've got boiler works, you've got Reliance Iron Works, which was owned by E.P. Alice. I think my... Uh, I think my timer's on. That's why the slides keep switching. The, um, so everything was focused in this part of town, a little bit north of downtown where all the tanneries, uh, but now everything is to the west, down west to the, in the Menominee River. And this area, the downtown area is primarily high-end condos and apartment buildings and a little bit of office buildings, but, but very little uh, industrial as it, as it was back then. I start with early covers because they interest me. This is a, a very early 1850s cover from a company called Lansing Bonnell. I don't know anything about their, uh, about their company, but it was a, an early lithograph cover and with a, a, on a Nesbitt postal, piece of postal stationery. Uh, George Nesbitt was hired by the post office to print these uh, pieces of postal stationery from the 1850s until 1870. Uh, more early covers, these are called cameo covers, they're embossed. And the cover on the left is by William Goodnow. 
and he went on to uh, sell his company, Bay State Foundry. That was the one I highlighted on the map. And he sold that to E.P. Alice, who went on later to found Alice of Alice Chalmers. And both of these covers were printed by a company, a printer called William Eaves out of New York. Very prolific printer of cameo covers. And uh, I was looking on the internet at some research with William Eaves. And there are 540 different designs attributed to him at least. Uh, two more early covers. These are both printed by a Milwaukee printer, uh, L. Lippman, but uh, Northwestern Mutual uh, is sort of the highlight here. They were founded in 1857 in Janesville, moved to Milwaukee in 1862, and they're still here. Uh, this is an 1866 cover, but uh, one funny thing about Northwestern Mutual, I'm not sure it's funny or sad, but they built a brand new, uh, they built a brand new office building in Milwaukee just before COVID, uh, and it has never been occupied by employees. It was built, COVID hit, they never occupied it, and they still haven't occupied it, so most of their employees are still working from home. Two more early covers, and uh, I point these out because they're both from companies that were on East Water Street. If you look at the addresses, the return addresses of a lot of these covers, you'll see East Water Street. A lot of commercial and some industrial uh, development along East Water Street, a little less under West Water Street, and then on the south side as well. Uh, Spencerian Biz Business College, you can see they emphasized penmanship. That was one of their uh, big claims to fame. You can see the uh, address is written in their uh, penmanship style. I sort of have this cover in as kind of a kind of a ratty cover. But I have this in there because my mother went to Spencerian Business College in the early 1950s and graduated, got a job up in uh, Nina, Wisconsin, where I'm from. And uh, she thought it was a real good business college. Uh, she came right out of high school, right off the farm, went to business college, and then moved on. Uh, this is a hotel cover, and the hotel has nothing to do with the reason it's in here. Uh, I want to point out the uh, Milwaukee spelling, the IE spelling, uh, like the city in, in M Milwaukee, Oregon. Uh, this spelling was used periodically between 1835 and 1862. Democrats like the IE spelling, and the uh, Republicans and the Whigs like the EE -E spelling. And 1835, Solomon Juno, one of the founders, liked the IE. He was the first postmaster, so he advocated for the IE in 1862. However, it was decided they settled on the EE -E spelling and, and that has stuck ever since. This is called a billboard cover. And as near as I can tell, a billboard cover was sponsored by one company here, E. Miller, who imported hair and uh, made hair jewelry, uh, which is interesting in and of itself. But he must have sold ads on the back, uh, the billboard portion of the cover. And, and there are some 40, 40 companies represented on the back and this covers from 1870. And what's interesting to me is as many covers as I have, I've got over uh, probably 1500 pre-World War II Milwaukee covers. And of all those uh, companies, I've only got four uh, that I have covers for. So it goes to show how many covers came and went over the years. So of course, Milwaukee has a big beer and brewing history. And a lot of colorful covers come out of that, most of them from the uh, 1900 on. But uh, here's a Schlitz and, and a photo of a Schlitz wagon. The story behind the reason Schlitz uses the beer that made Milwaukee famous is uh, in 1871, the Great Chicago Fire, uh, Schlitz sent, I, won't, I don't know how tons, uh, many, many barrels of beer to Chicago to to quench their thirst when their breweries burned down. And, and Schlitz used that to create the slogan, the beer that made Milwaukee famous. Pabst, another colorful cover, 1909. Uh, Pabst, their claim to fame in, in Milwaukee is they introduced the first lager beer to Milwaukee. Uh, until then, they were the heavier German beers. Pabst introduced the first lager. Uh, they won. Uh, 
Blue Ribbon in the 1893 uh, Columbian Exposition, and that's the derivation of Pabst Blue Ribbon beer. They also had an extract from the 1890s into the 1920s, Pabst extract sold in pharmacies as uh, medicinal aid. This is a nice pre-cancel cover, pretty early for a pre-cancel cover, probably prior to 1910. Uh, you can see an ad on the right for Pabst extract, and it's for uh, mothers and child. I want to read the, the first line in that ad is at that anxious time before and immediately after a baby is born, when the mother must bear a double burden, it is vitally important that she take on double strength. So they sold it in pharmacies. It was a medicinal aid and, and promoted. I got another ad from Harper's Magazine where they promote it for mother and baby. Uh, where, the, where the design comes out of the paper, uh, that's just a, a French technique called trompe l'oeil. And the drawing on the lower left is just a boy coming out of the, coming out of the uh, painting in that, in that same style. Fred Miller, Miller Brewing, he bought Plank Road Brewery in, uh, in the 1860s and changed the name to Miller Brewing Company. Uh, this is a picture of the original Plank Road Brewery in the lower left, and then a picture from the 1920s of of his bottling lines. The, um, this brewery was owned by Miller, Fred Miller's descendants until the 1960s. And you'll hear a lot of these companies me sort of bemoaning the fact that they were family owned until the 60s or the 70s or the 80s, uh, which is kind of depressing to me anyhow. Uh, Val Blatz, uh, he started, uh, Started brewing in 18, um, 18, um, I used to know, in the 1850s as well. Uh, this is a cover, the upper cover is from 1876, really the first piece of commemorative postal stationery issued by the uh, Postal Service. And it's uh, uh, going via England to Germany. Uh, Val Blatz's claim to fame is that he was the first one to sell bottled beer. In Milwaukee, and that's a picture of one of his early bottles in the upper right. Gettleman's a small brewery, uh, and uh, it's an interesting cover. They lasted a long time. They were selling beer when I was in college, and after that, and then they went out of business as well. This is a cover from a, a beer related not a brewery, but the beer sack manufacturing company manufactured holders that were uh, tacked onto a fixed to containers of beer. Uh, back then you had wooden barrels. Uh, you had to buy a stamp for a half barrel or a full barrel or a quarter barrel. And they had used thumbtacks to affix those. Well, those in transit were falling off. And so they were always looking for a better way. Well, beer sack invented uh, a little frame and patented a little frame that mounted to the barrels and actually had an identifier of what kind of beer it was, Pabst Brewing. And you can see on the, on the cover, he's got Pabst, he's got Anheuser-Busch, Blatt, Schlitz. And so it identified the beer, held the beer stamp and uh, worked out well. I assume they went out of business when metal, brew, metal barrels started uh, and the uh, stamp didn't have to be affixed to each container. This is just a little table of beer output. The only year in Milwaukee history where brewing was the leading industry was 1889. Uh, this is a, a table of output in 1891. It gives you an idea. Uh, the one thing I want to point out here is Falk. Uh, Falk had a, a brewery uh, near Pabst and it burned down twice. And so after the second time it burned down, he gave up the brewing business, sold his property to Pabst and uh, opened a machine shop. And I'll show you a cover from his machine shop when we, when we get into this next section, manufacturing. Uh, another overall cover from a industrial exposition that was held in 1881. Uh, the covers, I don't know if they were printed so lightly, but, but it's a little bit difficult to see but the exhibition hall 
was on the site that the arena is now located and the uh, exhibition hall burned down in 1905. Uh, George Burnham, Milwaukee is known as the cream city. The reason it's known as the cream city is when you make a brick out of the clay from the shore of Lake Michigan, it's, it's called for geologists, it's called lacustrine uh, clay. It turns a golden yellow color when it's fired. And that's the color of the two buildings, Pritzloff Hardware and one of the buildings in the, in the Blatt's uh, complex. But the uh, George Burnham's claim to fame was he invented a machine and patented a machine that, that used steam power to manufacture Cream City bricks called the Cream City Brick Machine. And uh, George Burnham created this machine and he did well and his business really accelerated in 1871. Again, the Chicago fire uh, created a lot of need for bricks and building material. And he sold over a half million bricks in 1871 uh, to various Chicago builders. So that's the origin of the Cream City. And if you drive through Milwaukee downtown, uh, Cream City, cream colored bricks probably lost interest in the 1920s. But if you see older homes, a lot of commercial buildings, if you drive around Milwaukee, you'll, you'll just see building after building uh, built out of these Cream City bricks. Um, here's a cover from Falk, Herman Falk. As I said, the uh, upper right is his brewery that burned down twice, or at least the site of his brewery. And he founded the Falk Corporation back in uh, 1888 as just a general machine shop. And he uh, developed a machine that could ride on the rails, the steam car rail or the streetcar rails and actually do repairs and cast, uh, uh, cast joints and repair the joints uh, on the portable, on the mobile uh, repair unit, which saved cities a lot of money. So he, that's how he got his company started. And then around the turn of the century, he went into making gears and his timing was perfect because first 1905, 1910, most everybody in the manufacturing sector was going from uh, belt driven equipment to electric motors uh, and, and going into gears. So, so his timing was perfect. It's a huge company, it's still headquartered in Milwaukee uh, and they still do uh, precision manufacturing in Milwaukee. Another cover from Johnson Controls, a lot of changes uh, at Johnson Controls. They were Johnson Electric Service, converted to Johnson Controls, uh, went through the World War II, 50s, 60s, uh, had acquired Globe Union, made batteries, made Sears diehard batteries, uh, interstate batteries. And then in the 1980s, they divested, 1980s, 1990s, they divested the battery business, uh, focused on industrial controls and climate HVAC controls. And then in the 2000s, they reorganized as an Irish company, changed their name to Johns Controls International. They built the building that you see below in 1902 and that building was occupied by Johns Controls until just this year when they sold it and, excuse me, consolidated their business into uh, their Glendale operation, Glendale, Wisconsin operation. So a lot of changes at Johns Controls. Uh, they're headquartered in Ireland now. They still have corporate officers here in Milwaukee. Uh, a couple more companies that, that when the story comes together, you'll recognize a uh, chain belt company organized in 1892, Nordberg founded by Bruno Nordberg in 1986. Uh, the chain belt made conveyor chains, initially primarily used in the breweries. Nordberg was a general machine shop. Uh, in 1973, uh, chain belt's main line of conveyors was called Rex, Rex chain belt. In 1972, chain belt company and Nordberg merged and became Rex Nord, which is still headquartered in Milwaukee. Again, a smaller corporation than it used to be, but uh, still a going concern with many plants around the country. Not much manufacturing in the Milwaukee area anymore, where they used to have hundreds and hundreds of employees 
at uh, three different locations in Milwaukee. Evinrude, Ole Evinrude invented his first uh, boat motor in 1907. And the legend has it that he was out on Okachi Lake, which is out near Oconomowoc, 30 or 40 miles west of Milwaukee. And his girlfriend, soon to be fiance, wanted ice cream. So he got in a rowboat, rowed across the lake to the ice cream shop, came back to his fiance. And by that time, of course, the ice cream was melted. So he said there had to be a better way. So he invented the boat motor. And that boat motor, one of the early, early boat motors is depicted there on the right. And uh, he was an internal combustion guy. He helped Harley Davidson uh, design their carburetor. And he is also known as the father of the lawn boy lawnmower. So he, he worked on industrial or uh, internal combustion engines his whole life. Harley Davidson, it is very, I have found, this is the only illustrated ad cover I found from Harley Davidson from Milwaukee. I found a few from uh, plants outside of Milwaukee, but Harley Davidson was started in 1903. That building is their first manufacturing uh, building when it was just Harley and Davidson. And then uh, in uh, 1905, they built a real factory to house all four of their employees at that time. Uh, and then they incorporated in 1907. Uh, they're a going concern, still headquartered in the Milwaukee area, a big plant out in Pennsylvania, uh, but they still do a lot of manufacturing in the Milwaukee area. Uh, this cover I just like, I, I like covers with stamps from the Pan American exhibit and uh, the picture of the boar. Uh, I didn't know this until I did a little research on this cover, but they still make hairbrushes out of boar hair. Uh, most of the boar hair comes from China and it's done humanely. They uh, sort of like a shearing operation for sheep and they uh, combine all the, the, the stiff bristles into hairbrushes. Uh, A.R. Wines made hairbrushes, fine brushes, but he also had a company that made what is called the dustless brush. And I've got a couple of covers from the dustless brush company. And, and back when they used wood floors, what the dustless brush did was it had a reservoir on top that people filled with kerosene. Then they would brush the floor and the kerosene would keep the dust down on the wood floors. Uh, obviously, it, I, it just had to stink like crazy, but Uh, some covers related to food. Here are two meat companies, Cudahy Brothers. And again, most of these companies were started in the 1850s, 60s, 70s. Cudahy started in 1888. Uh, the suburb of Cudahy is actually named after the company because they put in a, a, a train depot, a train stop, and the railroad called that Cudahy. And so the, the suburb, the city sprung up around there and the suburb is called, called Cudahy to this day. Uh, the Usinger store is still in the same location it was in the 1870s on what is now called Old World Third Street. Um, still selling meat and still doing it the old fashioned way. Uh, Ziegler's, I don't think most people, even Milwaukee natives, have heard of Ziegler's, but they have almost all heard of the giant candy bar, which has been around since the 1950s. Uh, it's a very colorful cover. That's the main reason I have it in here. The upper photo is a photo of their original uh, manufacturing plant, at least part of it. There used to be a part to the left, apparently, but that, uh, that was destroyed or demolished uh, for development. Uh, the fifth generation, Bill and Mary Ziegler, are still in the confection business and they have opened that half nut store. That's the middle photo. And uh, in West Dallas, Wisconsin, which is a suburb of Milwaukee. And you can still buy giant bars. They, they have uh, re, uh, reinstituted the giant bar and uh, bring back a lot of memories. When I was here in the seventies, uh, they were very common. I have these two disparate covers on one slide uh, for a reason. Uh, 
uh, you can see Red Star yeast. Back in those days, yeast was a nutritional supplement as it's becoming more popular today as a nutritional supplement. But uh, I love the lower left on the back of that cover, eat two cakes a day. Uh, my wife eats nutritional yeast. She sprinkles it on cereal. She sprinkles it on uh, yogurt and eats it as a nutritional supplement. Uh, Red Star yeast manufactured, of course, brew, uh, uh, brewing yeast, manufactured bread yeast, and still do to this day. But the reason I have these two covers together is Ambrosia Chocolate was located down, stop, downtown on 5th Street, Red Star yeast down in the valley on Buffalo. And for anybody that's lived in Milwaukee in the 60s and 70s, if you had a cloudy day, very humid, uh, the air was thick, uh, Ambrosia was making chocolate, Red Star was making yeast, you drove downtown, that odor was so thick and so, at least to me, so disgusting that it, it really made Milwaukee what it was. And I understand before the 70s, when I moved here in the 60s, there were a couple of rendering plants down in the valley as well. So when you mix the thick Ambrosia chocolate smell, the thick Red Star yeast smell and the, and the rendering plants, I guess it was just terrible. Uh, Red Star yeast still exists. They're still headquartered in Milwaukee. The company is owned by a French company, Le Saf, uh, but all of the Milwaukee yeast production was shut down in the 1990s and a new plant was built in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. Uh, Ambrosia Chocolates also still in Milwaukee. They're up on the Northwest side. That company was purchased by Cargill. And I think they went up for sale because uh, they were sold shortly after uh, Jeffrey Dahmer. If anybody remembers the, the, the serial killer, Jeffrey Dahmer, he was an employee at Ambrosia Chocolate. And uh, at least in Milwaukee, he got a lot of bad press. And shortly thereafter, Ambrosia was sold to Cargill. They still make Ambrosia branded chocolate uh, but it's now by Cargill. Uh, this cover, in addition to being Pan American uh, stamps, is for a whole, wholesale and retail grocery. And it's a very attractive cover, obviously. But uh, the reason I it went out of business, Steinmeier uh, got rich because it was upscale grocery and he never accepted credit. You couldn't run a tab at the Steinmeier grocery store. You had to pay cash and uh, very successful doing that. And uh, my mother-in-law has told stories that when she was a girl, uh, her parents would go to Steinmeier's whenever they were on company over for dinner because it was high end. Jewett and Sherman, they were an importer of spices, coffee, tea, and uh, it's a nice cover. It's gone all over the country. It went here, went there uh, with the pointing finger but I have this cover in there to point out the post office seal. Uh, now, if a cover gets damaged or a cover gets uh, uh, accidentally opened, they put it in one of those plastic sleeves and send it on its way. Uh, earlier days, uh, for, for many decades, they used these adhesive official seals. So this one uh, left Milwaukee, uh, got damaged somewhere, and then went to the post office and got the seal put on and then went to Providence, Rhode Island, its final destination. Um, I apologize for the slides keep changing. The timer must be set and I don't wanna interrupt to change that timer. So just bear with me. Consumer goods and services, uh, again, more colorful covers uh, representing brownies on the left and elves on the right. Brownies are English and Scottish, uh, elves are Germanic, and used by these two companies to, to present an image, uh, use their heritage to bring in business. Both brownies and elves sort of are mischievous creatures, uh, sometimes supernatural, uh, different legends associated with both brownies and elves. Uh, Schuster's department store in Milwaukee uh, used elves or used uh, brownies in their Christmas displays and their main brownie was called Billy the Brownie. And I think that stopped in the 70s and 80s, but it was long lasting. This is a wrapper. Wrappers were used when you were mailing uh, newspapers, magazines, 
uh, rolled up, the wrapper was put around it, postage affixed the label. I'm not sure this qualifies in an, as an advertising cover, but uh, because I went to Germany, because it's got the 15 cent Colombian on it, and I happen to have a postcard and a picture of the, the actual bookstore, uh, Casper claimed that he was the largest foreign language bookstore uh, in the country. I don't know how he would prove that, but an interesting wrapper. <clears throat> For anybody who likes maps on covers, this is a map of the city of Milwaukee before Wauwatosa was uh, annexed as part as a suburb. And it's for Hawks Nursery. And it shows the streetcar lines to get out to Hawks, to uh, buy your trees, buy your uh, bushes, buy your plants and flowers. It was actually, for those that know Milwaukee, it was on the intersection of North Avenue and Swan Boulevard, which is close to the downtown Wauwatosa. And if the, you look at the square down here, uh, that was in the area where the streetcar ended uh, in Wauwatosa on 68th and uh, Wisconsin Avenue. And that was actually the, uh, Hawks had a farm out there. And that was actually the location of my in-laws home after that area was developed. This cover represents a couple of Milwaukee retailers and I point this out because uh, it was very popular for manufacturers of here the pepsin gum and the fruit juices to uh, provide their retailers with the covers, to provide their retailers with the printed covers and then they would go ahead and print the, uh, their uh, return address on them and uh, when we look at the next set of covers, the gun covers, you'll see Remington provided the cover, the lower cover, with the woman printed on there to John Manier, the uh, Milwaukee gunsmith. And a couple of covers, gun covers, for those that collect gun covers, uh, the demand is high, the price is high. Uh, which is unfortunate because a lot of them are very colorful and, and interesting, which is why I like them. But the covers usually, the prices usually scare me away. The gun in the lower left was manufactured. It's a museum piece here in Milwaukee, in the Milwaukee Public Museum. And it's uh, actually a gun manufactured by John Manier. A couple more Milwaukee companies that Milwaukee natives will recognize, Joseph Flanner, uh, who turned into Flanner and Half Seuss later on. Now they exist as Flanner's Home Entertainment, still located in Milwaukee. And then Bradford Organ uh, sold Palace Organs at the time. They came, uh, became uh, Bradford Music, uh, selling organs and pianos. Uh, both of those covers, both of those companies lasted. Uh, uh, I mean, Bradford's lasted until 2007 when they closed permanently. Guess was Magic Headache Wafers. This is a rare cover. Patriotic covers for the Spanish-American War were usually the flag motif, but it's very unusual to find a cover with the uh, letters, the return address printed in the star design. So this is a, a very nice cover. It's in good condition, I love it. But the uh, advertisement on the lower right is an ad that was in the Minneapolis paper, as a matter of fact, offering $500 to anybody who could prove that Gessler's magic headache wafers did not cure a headache. Interesting uh, approach. Uh, his, headache, his headache wafers were actually made out of uh, caffeine and acetaanilide, which is a, an analgesic, a painkiller, uh, non-addictive, but not as effective as aspirin. So once aspirin came into being, the acid analyte uh, it really isn't sold anymore. It still exists as an analgesic. A couple more Milwaukee companies, Weinberg Shoes. Uh, they still are headquartered in Milwaukee, known as the Weiko Group. And at one time, they manufactured Florsheim, Stacey Adams, and Nunbook Shoes. Uh, now they import. Those brands still exist, but they're imported by the Weiko Group and sold. Boston store, the building still exists on 3rd and Grand Avenue, 3rd and Wisconsin Avenue. Uh, but Boston store was sold to Bonton 
and Boston store still exists as an online retailer, but it no longer exists as a physical store. A couple of interesting features, Lindsay Brothers was a hardware store, wholesale and retail. A picture of the building, a modern picture that I took is the lower right. You can still see the, the masthead on the building. The date it was built, 1892. Uh, that's now an office building and uh, uh, partially vacant, being redeveloped. Uh, one thing I like about the cover is it's got a perfin on it, a stamp with perforated initials called a perfin. And perforated initials were created by various companies. And you can see the LB, I painted in the I painted in the uh, perfins, the perforations in black, so they're easier to see. LB stands for Lindsay Brothers. Uh, perfins were created just strictly to reduce theft by employees. Uh, obviously, or apparently, people were taking stamps home, so uh, companies would have initials of various kinds. And it's a it's a collecting interest for a lot of people, and to see which companies Johns Controls. I've got a postcard that has a a JCI, uh, Johns Controls Internet, or Johns Controls Incorporated Perfin. Uh, the next cover, HH West, just a, they were an off supply store for many years, uh, founded in the 1840s. Uh, I bought office supplies when I was in graduate school in the 1970s from an HH West uh, store downtown. They went out of business shortly after that. I guess I didn't buy enough stuff. This is called an advertising collar. And as you can see, the Straw and Ellsworth took a piece of postal stationery and then had a printer print their collar around that for advertising and for decoration. You'll find a lot of advertising collars that are both on postal stationery and advertising collars, uh, collars where there's a, a space left for the place for the stamp to be affixed. Uh, I don't know how effective it was at advertising, but it's very interesting. Don't do that. I've got one hotel cover here because the hotel is very interesting. Newhall House was uh, built on the corner. It was a luxury hotel built on the corner of Michigan and Broadway in 1856. It burned down in 1883. Uh, and because it burned down and 75 people were killed, it created a big furor and the Milwaukee Journal had uh, many, many articles on it. And that was sort of uh, the Milwaukee Journal's uh, kickoff and how they became a well-circulated newspaper. But uh, in 1859, Abraham Lincoln stayed here. Three years after it was built, Abraham Lincoln stayed here because he was giving a talk at the Wisconsin Agricultural Fair, which was an offshoot or a, a precursor to the Wisconsin State Fair. And at that time, it was held on 13th, right around 13th and Wells or 13th and Grand Avenue, which is an area now owned by the uh, Marquette University. I have a cover here that has puzzled me for many years. Uh, it's probably from the 1870s or 1880s based on the stamp. There's no hard date on it, but the inset uh, text is actually advertising for equal, equal rights for women uh, long before the suffrage movement. And, and I have very little information on this cover. Denman and Company was apparently a small variety store, uh, again on East Water Street, another East Water Street business. Uh, this cover, as a clue, was sent to Francis Abbott, who was the editor of the Index. And the Index was a magazine uh, headquartered in Boston, and the magazine uh, was anti-religion, anti-organized religion, uh, more uh, in favor of rationality and against religion. And that's sort of a, I guess, part of a clue. But uh, if anybody ever comes across anything related to Denman and Company, I would be very interested in the people that had this printed and, and what their involvement was in the equal rights, uh, suffrage, uh, and, and religious movements. It's just a very interesting cover that I know very little about. So celebrations, I think someone here mentioned the Wisconsin semi-centennial 
for Wisconsin Centennial before the talk. Uh, but uh, here's a cover for Wisconsin State Fair. Shortly after they moved to Milwaukee permanently in 1912, uh, the first Wisconsin State Fair was down in Janesville, and then it moved around through the state, was held in Milwaukee, was held in Madison, uh, was held down in uh, uh, Janesville, all parts of the state. And uh, just a colorful cover after they moved permanently to Milwaukee. This is a, a cover that was sponsored. Uh, sponsored by over 70 different companies for the Wisconsin State Semi-Centennial in 1898. Uh, this happens to be Frank Firth Hardware, but uh, over 70 companies advertised on this cover. Uh, Dan Shilkrat wrote an article in the American Philatelist in October of 99. And then in 99, Milwaukee Field Talk Society used this design as, as one of their show covers. So uh, uh, interesting cover. And I've got a handful of different companies uh, nowhere near the 70 that, that are fully represented. Here's a, another celebration cover. Uh, I think most everybody on this call is old enough to remember when covers were distributed for uh, celebrations, shows, commemorative, commemorative reasons. And this is for a 1901 Elks reunion. And I've got three covers representing uh, three different companies and I'm sure there were dozens and dozens but I haven't done an inventory. Uh, again a very interesting design the elk and the woman riding the elk side saddle of course. <clears throat> Two more festivals the National Sanger Fest which is translated into Festival of Singers. Uh, it's still an ongoing fest. Uh, it was held in Milwaukee in 19 in 2013. And then the Milwaukee Jarmark, and Jarmark uh, translates to um, Folk Fest. I've got it written down somewhere, but my notes aren't, aren't that handy. Uh, but again, another colorful cover uh, for the Milwaukee Jarmark that was held in, in 1902. The, the people up in the, in the picture up there uh, were actually, it's actually a photograph of the 1902 Jarmark. Uh, and they don't look happy at all. Social activities, here's the uh, Washington Park Zoo. Washington Park was designed like a lot of parks in Milwaukee by Frederick Law Olmsted. And the zoo was there until, uh, until it moved out to, the, to where the zoo is now. And uh, it's original, it was the fifth largest zoo after it was built. And it had mainly wildlife, deer, a couple of bears, and uh, birds, but a nice cover with a picture of a lion. A uh, big social activity, even when I was a kid, was pen pals. Uh, the Cosmopolitan Correspondence Club was founded in Milwaukee in 1900. It had over 6,000 members at one point with correspondence going to over 100 different companies. Uh, but it didn't last very long. Uh, based on what I could find in archives, uh, the library, the historical society, it sort of faded away uh, during and shortly after World War I. I don't know if the war had anything to do with it, but I know even when I was a kid, pen pals were, were popular, so I'm not quite sure why it faded away. But again, a wrapper, we mentioned a wrapper earlier uh, for a newspaper or a magazine. Uh, finally, we've got the Old Settlers Club. Uh, in 1869, a group of guys, and it was guys, got together uh, to uh, relate the history of Milwaukee. So anybody who was settled in Milwaukee before 1839, and of course the men, it was only open to men, the, uh, formed a group and wrote a lot of articles, had a uh, they have a large archive at the Milwaukee Public Library and at the Historical Society of all the personalities and people involved in the founding of Milwaukee. And of course, since in the beginning, it was only open to people that were, who settled before 1839, that's, that's almost an automatic death sentence. So in 1881, they decided to admit the sons of anybody who arrived before 1843. And that kept them going for a while. Uh, but then again, around Again, around the, the World War I, the 
society faded away. So that's all I've got. I know I rushed.